In contrast to Melbourne, the heart of the hunter was bathed in spring sunshine for that magical first Tuesday in November, Cup Day. A near record crowd packed Skeletar Park, which was a mixture of the latest fashions and frenetic gambling. On course, punters were hopeful former local hoop Wayne Harris could boot home Jeune and become just the fifth horse to win the Melbourne Cup twice. But it wasn't to be, with most then out to get their money back on the $30,000 local cup, which contained a horse that could figure in next year's Melbourne Carnival, Spiritual Star. Unofficially across the line, Dancing Sun, ridden by Harry Troy, was too good for Fox Road and River Breeze. This is Stuart Fairley's backyard at Morissette Lake Macquarie. He admits it looks like a tip. Last year he organised for a contractor to have his dam enlarged by a new process which uses old tyres as part of the dam wall. And so the tyres started to come in, truckload after truckload. Far more tyres in came onto the block than I thought was, uh, was required. We then, uh, then questioned uh, the number of tyres and uh, his answer was that uh, were for other developments that he had in mind. Around 4,000 tyres have been dumped and 15 months on, with the dam not finished, the Lake Macquarie Council has given fairly two months to remove the tyres or erect a screen around the property or face a $5,000 fine. This is the man who brought all the tyres in. He's moved on to another job up the road, building a retaining wall with old tyres. Noel Keery is paid by the tyre companies to take away old tyres, up to $15 each for the big truck tyres. And when you're dealing in thousands, that can be big money. Old tyres are a problem to dispose of. Keery has been given support from certain councils and the Environmental Protection Authority to go ahead with the work. But now all Stuart Fairley wants is for Kiri to remove the tyres. Kiri says it's not his problem and if a fine comes through... I reckon he should. They're not his tyres. Well, I know they're not his tyres, but he agreed to get and the job done. I put him there to do the job. It all comes back to payment for the job. Fairley says the deal was that Kiri gets paid for the tyres by the tyre companies and so he did the work for free. Kiri says he was to be paid by Fairley for the job. That money hasn't come through and so he's left the work site. At least two other property owners claimed they are in a similar position after dealing with Kiri. Peter Ryan, NBN News. It's not about war, it's about peace. And that's what 50 years of remembering means. We don't want this sort of thing to happen again, not for our, our sake, but the sake of future generations. And Billy 
Fisher is a Yorkshire lad who likes to have a good time, but it's at the expense of others. Billy is played by Grant Jury, who captures the dreamer and larrikin in his character and heads the 12-star cast of the comedy production that launched Michael Crawford's career. The show is based on the Keith Waterhouse novel, play and film titled Billy Liar and it's claimed to be one of the funniest productions ever tackled by the Metropolitan Players. Songs have been composed by John Barry, whose film scores include Born Free and Dances with Wolves. Don Black wrote the lyrics. The production opens next Wednesday at Newcastle University's Drama Theatre and runs until early December. Fifty-four-year-old Alan Kavanagh has spent more than half his life surveying Newcastle. Now he's off to new turf, Egypt. Selected by the New South Wales Institution of Surveyors, he'll test his expertise to measure and map excavations and tombs at Saqqara and on the west bank of the River Nile at Luxor in Egypt. It's, a, it's an opportunity to, uh, to work in a, in a different place and it's an opportunity to uh, just present what surveyors in fact as a profession can do. The three-week expedition is part of Macquarie University's ongoing study of the sites. Some of the ancient burial grounds he will visit are more than 5,000 years old and in almost pristine condition. But it's uh, just a fascinating country. It's uh, so diverse and uh, a mixture of people. It's a tremendous place. Are you crazy? Vivid imagination. Mr Kavanagh braved the harsh Egyptian conditions two years ago on a tour but denies he's trying to relive the adventures of Indiana Jones. <laughs> I'm not Indiana Jones as I, uh, at all, uh, although maybe Indiana Jones is probably my age now. He heads off for Egypt later this month. Heather Stewart, NBN News. The North Coast Schools team put up a valiant fight in the Battle of Words, but adjudicators were unanimous in deciding Mulbring Primary School's debaters were the champions. And after witnessing the winning team's fiery display, they were convinced there was no substance to the statement that life is easier for girls than boys. The two teams emerged finalists after three days of tough talking against six other regional teams. Proud parents, friends and teachers gathered to see the final. The official word was that the standard of debating was outstanding. Heather Stewart, NBN News. The ALP adopted the Hunter's need for a third linear accelerator as a state election platform. 
Today, Health Minister Dr Andrew Refshorgi met with Mata Hospital executives to discuss the purchase and commissioning of the equipment. By August next year, we should have that machine up and running, possibly even before. It's a $1.6 million machine, but it certainly is going to make a major difference for cancer treatment here in the Hunter. It means that patients will be able to get their treatment here uh, with the latest technology. Accelerators are used to bombard areas of a cancer patient's body with radiation. Of the two units at the MARTA, one is in need of overhaul. It's hoped the third machine will take up the workload until all three are back online for an expansion of services. While in Newcastle, the Health Minister opened the Child and Family Services Centre in what had been a mothballed wing of Walls End Hospital. The centre offers early childhood clinics, school medical checkups, youth and sexual assault victim counselling. Tribute was paid to the guardians of Walls End Hospital, volunteers whose efforts kept a pulse beating in the hospital after it was closed in 1991. We're also pleased that uh, upstairs in a few months' time the Public Health Unit and the Migrant Health Resource Unit will be up there as well. And uh, it's good to see you know, the facilities of Walls End actually being recycled and put to good use. Everybody's always playing pool and snookering pubs and clubs and I felt I'm going to give this a go too. Swansea's Angie Phillips started playing for fun but now she's vying for a world title. She's already won the Newcastle and Central Coast Ladies titles and will fly out on Monday to compete in the World Nine Ball Championships in Taiwan. It's taken plenty of time at the table to become one of the best, her training schedule including a couple of hours practice a day. But she says there's no secret to her success. It all comes down to the right preparation. Have a strong glass of water and don't look at anybody. If I look at somebody, that uh, puts more pressure on me. And there's more bad news for any fragile male egos, with many more ladies keen to show the men how to play. Not just me, but uh, a few Maitland girls that are up and coming, uh, they're going to rock the guys in Sydney and show them a thing or two. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. The Falcons were back in training last night, with Tony Jensen to play his last game for Newcastle against the Korean team SBS. The departure of Jensen and Reggie Smith has left a large hole in the team that made this year's semi-finals. But one local junior is keen to fill those shoes, 200 centimetre forward Scott McGregor. We always dream as a little kid to play for your hometown and now I've got that chance so now I've just got to take it. McGregor was part of the Australian team that won silver at this year's Junior World Championships. The 19-year-old only started basketball five years ago, but has trained at the Australian Institute of Sport for the past two years. Sit back and think, well, where did I come from? That rapid rise is set to continue tomorrow, when the Falcons play the Korean team at the Broadmeadow Basketball Stadium from 2 o'clock. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. A ride through a Newcastle park is about as far as you can get from the intensity of the Hawaii Ultraman. But it's Kevin Kutjar's last hit out before flying out tomorrow. In three weeks he'll increase the tempo as he races against some of the fittest athletes in the world. 
On the first day is a 10 kilometre swim and a 140 kilometre bike ride. Uh, the second day is it starts where that day finished and uh, it's a 270 kilometre bike ride around the coast of uh, the Big Island. And the third day is a double marathon 84k run. It's his second assault on Hawaii after finishing 170th out of 1,500 athletes at the Hawaii Ironman. It's been a quick rise for the 29-year-old who competed in his first triathlon five years ago after a chance introduction to the sport. I read an article in a magazine, you know, beginner to triathlete in 12 weeks and uh, so I thought I can do that so I did it and did a triathlon and, and got hooked. The addiction is fed through 20 hours of training a week, with the ultimate test just over the horizon. I wouldn't like to say where I'm going to come in the field because my main focus is going to be just uh, to finish the thing and I think that'll be an achievement in, for myself. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. Newcastle joined the nation on Remembrance Day, standing still to reflect on the tragic loss of life for freedom. At Civic Park, hundreds gathered to pay their respects. Later, outside the Newcastle Post Office, a plaque was erected in memory of thousands who died serving in the 35th Battalion. Retired Colonel Fred Armstrong summed up the characters of the men he led. They're a marvellous lot, and a battalion is what you helped to make it. Uh, they can be a lot of ruffians and they can be a lot of gentlemen. Heather Stewart, NBN News. Snap is starting to come home pretty well. Uh, coming to the 250 in the lead at Talanda. Snap finishing solidly. Sober Suiter's down the outside. Uh, and also Juggler from a long way back. But Talanda is still the leader. Sober Suit and wide on the track is Juggler. And Seaske. Seaske bursting through in the middle. Quickly grabs the lead. And it's a double for Seaske. Two years running. Seaske wins it from Talanda. Juggler third. That makes two Nissan stakes for Seaske. It paid 11 10 and 360 The trifecta $2,413.80. But an unfortunate incident before the race, when Greg Hall became the third jockey this week to be injured in a fall at Flemington. Hall was riding tenor to the barrier when the horse suddenly reared, throwing him to the ground. Ambulance officers treated him trackside before he was taken to hospital suffering a fractured wrist. Meanwhile, his horse was on the run, crashing through a fence. Racing was also in Sydney. Our best race seven over 1,600 metres. Breath wind up. Magic Road, the leader over Soup Kitchen with 100 to go. Magic Road starting to draw clear of Soup Kitchen in the last bit. And Magic Road for Nathan Stanley, too strong. And beat Soup Kitchen and upwards with Wyvern. Magic Road paid 370 and 160. The trifecta 77.30. The 16-foot skiffs were thrown about like toy boats as they tried to come to terms with the southerly. The 21 kilometres testing even the most experienced sailors. By the halfway mark, the Greg Hyde skip at Otis had control of the race, eventually winning by more than three minutes. Barracuda to UE came in second after finishing third yesterday. The best of the locals, Belmont's Beachwood home, skippered by John Millwood. Richard O'Leary, NBN News.
The boiler maker had only been on duty at the steelworks for a couple of hours when a day at work turned to tragedy. Alan Cook at about quarter to 11 this morning was participating in a work team that was preparing to demolish some redundant equipment when the skillion roof that he was working on fell and it uh, crushed him. There was another three blokes on the job who had to leap for their life anyhow when the accident happened. So uh, it's certainly been, while it's one, it could have been four. The latest incident has increased fears about the level of safety at BHP with four people killed since March. In April, 35-year-old diver Steve Lamb died after being sucked into the pipes he was trying to repair. A month before, 37-year-old Peter Naylor and 55-year-old Kevin Fenning were killed after molten metal exploded over their crane. Steel workers walked off the job after that incident, but the union doesn't expect similar action despite continuing concerns about safety. We'll be certainly talking to BHP to see what went wrong. We have had a couple of fatalities over there lately and nobody goes to work to lose their lives. So. Clearly, clearly it is. Our commitment is to safety. Any accident is unacceptable and the company's shocked. There's not much more I can add to that. BHP, Police and Work Cover will all conduct separate investigations, with the results not expected to be known for some days. Meanwhile, workers at BHP are still in shock after the loss of a 28-year veteran of the plant. When anyone new went to the centre plant, he basically took them under his wing anyhow and told them where everything was, the facts of life in the department, the lot. So he was certainly, I suppose, what you'd call a guru in the department. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. The boy was charged by police last night with murdering an 18-year-old woman and her 47-year-old mother. While he was being interviewed by police, crime scene officers were gathering evidence from a Toronto house and trying to piece together the events which led to the killing. Earlier in the afternoon, police were called to the house by distressed neighbours. There they found the body of the 18-year-old while her mother was in a critical condition outside. She died as she was being flown to John Hunter Hospital. Both women suffered multiple stab wounds. The 13-year-old boy was arrested around a kilometre from the house. He was treated later for injuries to his hand. In Newcastle Children's Court today, the child sat quietly cradled by his grandmother. Solicitor John Borsig told the court that the matter was one of considerable gravity. He asked that the magistrate make specific orders about identifying anyone involved. Magistrate Warren Cook ordered that the child's identity not be revealed. He even went as far as to suppress the names of the two victims. Police prosecutor Lee Shearer supported the order. The interests of the child in this matter are paramount. The boy will be kept in custody. He'll come before the court again next week. Jody McKay, NBN News. Kirian Clark was before Cessnock local court today, her arm in a sling after yesterday's incident. Police allege Clark, with 29-year-old George Robert Reagan and 24-year-old Scott Andrew Lewins, threatened the shopkeeper of the Paxton General Store with a .22 calibre rifle, escaping with $300 in cash. A police chase followed, the robbers allegedly hitting speeds of 140 kilometres per hour. The stolen getaway car was eventually dumped in bush. Lewins was arrested soon after, charged with the robbery and driving offences. Clark was also picked up and charged with the robbery, plus firearms charges including attempt to use an offensive weapon with the intent to prevent lawful apprehension. Paul Air was called in to search for the third fugitive who was tracked down to a Cessnock house where the police special operations officers negotiated with him to come out. George Reagan was charged with the robbery, firearms and drug offences. Police have also charged Reagan with another armed robbery eight days ago at a news agent's at Ties Hill in Newcastle. All three were remanded to reappear in Cessnock local court on November 28. Peter Ryan, NBN News.
To celebrate 21 years of dance teaching, the Marie Walton Mann Academy is going all out for its latest performance, which features 240 students. The dancers were putting the finishing touches on the production today. Aladdin is such fun. The music is wonderful, the costumes are great and it gives uh, 15 also students to excel as main parts. The second part is a Western symphony piece which gives the boys a chance to show off their style and instead of wearing traditional ballet tights, they wear a cowboy hat and trousers. On hand to add the polishing touches, the Australian Ballet State Manager Suzanne Davidson who says Newcastle dancers are in a class of their own. I mean, it's a sort of joke, what's in the water, but I think it's actually a reflection of the community. The community is a very, very close-knit community. The $21,000 production will be staged at the Civic Theatre on the 26th of this month. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. The opening of the game at Spears Point Pool was fast and furious with Alstonville in blue caps charging ahead to lead 2-0 in the first four minutes. But Glendale made a defiant comeback with some swift goals. Both goalies, Glendale's Ross Wales and Ashley Ozzels from Alstonville were working overtime, saving points as the teams matched each other goal for goal. The boys went into the last quarter locked at 5-all and were 6-all in the final minutes. A well-timed throw put Alstonville one point ahead and despite a desperate last-minute attempt, Glendale was unable to even the score with the full-time result 7-6. Alstonville will travel to Sydney for the semi-final tomorrow. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. A vacant inner city block on the corner of Scott and Watt Streets is an enduring scar of the 89 earthquake. It was occupied by the George Hotel, which was demolished in controversial circumstances after the quake. But controversy is stirring again, this time over plans for a new building which exceeds council height guidelines for that part of the city. It's going to be a, a landmark building for a landmark site. Guidelines are exactly that. They establish an intention for the way that one uh, establishes a design for a site for a building. Building owners on the other side of the block say they'll lose their views. In this case we are approximately 60 centimetres or two feet above the height recommendation. Two feet will make very little uh, impression on the, on, on the overall scheme of things. The consortium of Newcastle and Sydney businessmen behind the project will have to wait another month for an answer on their development application. Last night, Council decided that more community consultation was needed. Critics claim the consortium has no intention of building the complex but simply enhancing the site for a quick sale. Our clients, uh, the owners of the site and the developers for the site are very genuine in, uh, in their attempts to want to do something that will be a worthwhile quality development in this part of town. Today, students at Raymond Terrace's Irrawang High School gave their principal of 13 years a standing ovation as he entered a special farewell assembly. Ray Beaumont has worked in many schools throughout the state and has seen a number of changes. According to Mr Beaumont, subjects like hospitality, office studies and building and construction will become more common. In recent years, the introduction of vocational education into year 11 and year 12, it's only just starting. The other change would have been in the 80s, the changes associated with school renewal, which gave us a little more power over our funds and a little more selection opportunities of our senior staff. Irrawang High School will have a new principal tomorrow, while Mr Beaumont plans to enjoy his retirement by playing golf, gardening and travelling.
equality of the sexes isn't working in the classroom where the girls are outperforming the boys, especially in English. On average, the girls are scoring more than 6% better than their opposite sex, and teachers want the boys to take note. Whatever they do, English is going to be a part of their working life and their lives outside work as well. At Dungog High School in the Hunter Valley, a new program was run today to get the boys motivated. A lawyer, actor and musician spoke with groups of Year 9 and 10 students on how English has helped them in their careers. The, the talent's there. The kids, the kids have got all sorts of creative talents. Um, they've just got to tap into those. It seems young boys today are still affected by the Aussie ochre image. They're simply not prepared to show their emotional and creative sides. We see boys that we know have talents hiding them very successfully. The girls are also beating the boys in art and languages and have fought back to be equal with the boys in science and maths. Peter Ryan, NBN News.